Ray, trained in neuroscience as I am, I very much have focused on how the brain works and how that helps us understand the mind and consciousness. And I am skeptical about how far the brain can be used to explain consciousness. But I have never been skeptical about memory. Uh, memory seems to be encoded in neuronal activities and the, in the, in the uh, exchange of chemicals between neurons. Um, you have a different cut on memory, and I'd like to understand that. I mean, there are lots of reasons for thinking there will never be an adequate neurophysiological account of memory. The first is memory has double intentionality, and let me tease this out a bit. If you think of my current experience of an object in front of me, a glass, I have the experience, let's say, in my visual cortex, and it is of something other than my visual cortex. It has an aboutness, that so-called intentionality. And that is something that's very difficult to fit into a materialist notion of consciousness. But memory is even worse, because memory is about previous experiences. So you have two levels of aboutness. When I remember something, I not only recall the experience, but I recall the thing that the experience was about. So there you are, big problems to begin with. Secondly, there is a fundamental physical problem. If you really believe that mind and brain are identical, and if you really believe the brain is a material object, and if you really believe that physics is the last word on what material objects are, then you're completely unable to explain how tense, the past tense in particular, can be generated in the brain. So in other words, the sense I have when I'm remembering something that is, is no longer present, that it refers to the past, is something that is not possible uh, within a materialist framework. As Einstein famously said, he spoke of the sense of the past and present and future being illusions. He says there's no science of now, there's no science of the past, there's no science of the future. So if you're a serious physicalist, seriously believe that the brain actually uh, is an explanation of memory, then you've got a lot of explanation to do. In particular, how does the brain, a bit of matter, generate the past tense. Okay, look, I can imagine that it, for something to be a memory that's, that I have of the past as opposed to a thought I have of the future, there's some kind of encoding or some part of the brain that says this is a past thing and, there's, and, it, and it attaches itself to that memory and different parts of the brain working together. So I can, not that this is the way it works, but I can imagine how a, a physical object can attach pastness or futureness to different uh, expressions. But my, um, my fundamental question, if, if that were not the case, and you're arguing that it's not the case, what then could be the case? What, what is an alternative explanation? What is a even a possible alternative explanation? Well, I think there's a good job to be done in showing the barrenness of current explanations. And let's just look at some of the great neurophysiological models of memory. Think of the model of the sea slug. Uh, that Eric Kandel used in his experiments, which yes. he got the Nobel Prize. I mean, his experiments were absolutely fantastic, technically beautiful. And he, his, his model of memory was the sea slug, and what he essentially did was give it a nasty shock, and it behaved differently subsequently. And he then looked at what had happened to the synapses and so on and so forth, and, and he teased out in exquisite detail the chemical changes within the synapses. And I'm going to say, well, is the changed behavior of the sea slug. Is that really a good model of memory? Does the sea slug have the following? Does it rack its meager allocation of 20,000 neurons to remember facts? Does it have a sense of its own past? Does it feel nostalgia? All of those things of an explicit sense of that which is no longer, which is central to our sense of memory. These are all missing in the physiological models. And in fact, nearly all the physiological models of memory relate to what is called habit memory, which is a transformation of the behavior of an object, an organism, or whatever, as a result of the impact on it of experience. So if you look at those models, they don't get anywhere near what memory is like for us. So what follows from that? Assuming that to be the case, which I don't necessarily agree with, but I want to see what follows. Well, what follows is we need to think again about the whole conceptual framework in which we think about the nature of memory. And it may be that a physicalist approach to memory is a wrong one. Now, you may say, well, hang on a moment. We've got some amazing observations on patients. I work with patients with strokes 
who've had particular lesions which have led to particular problems with memory. So how do you square that? You know, the brain clearly must have a central role in memory. Yes, indeed, and I think it is a necessary condition for memory, but I don't think it is a sufficient condition for memory, and I don't think that neural activity in a particular part of the brain will come anywhere near to being an account of what memory is. What then must you add to that? I think we need to start thinking. I think our thoughts about the nature of memory, just as they have about the nature of consciousness, have been almost arrested. They've reached premature closure, if you like, as a result of people um, thinking that they have arrived at solutions or they've got a conceptual framework within which solutions may arrive. And I feel my job is to point out that conceptual framework is confused and muddled. You have to understand that what you are challenging is the fundamental basis for all modern science of, uh, of the brain and the mind and neurology, even biology. I don't think so. For example, I do believe, if I take a, a condition which I have a particular interest, which is epilepsy, I've run epilepsy clinics for 20 years, I have absolutely no doubt that the loss of consciousness in patients who had epilepsy was due to massive synchronous discharges of neuronal activity, and that's what blotted out their consciousness. But it doesn't mean to say that the consciousness that was blotted out was entirely normal due to normal neuronal activity. Let me give an example. I mean, there is a difference between, say, having an epileptic fit, which can be almost completely simply explained in terms of neural activity, and the decision that a person makes whether or not to take the tablets, whether or not to trust me, the doctor, whether or not to declare they have epilepsy on their driving license. These are much more different kinds of things which involve a completely different realm. So, if you like, the simpler the activity, twitches and epileptic fits and so on, come close to being explained pretty well completely by neural activity. And certainly loss of capacity uh, can be explained in terms of uh, damage to neural structures. But when we come to the consequences, the human consequences, how a person deals with these things, then we've left the brain behind. I don't think I, by looking, peering to the brain of my patients with seizures, I could see what corresponds to them trusting me as a doctor and deciding to take the tablets. So then what do you have to add to make memory in addition to what's in the brain? I wish I could tell you. I mean, some people have produced monstrous hypotheses, the notion of morphic resonance that basically our brains just tune into stuff that's floating in the air. You immortal can, souls. In, you're going to appeal to the idea of mortal soul. Uh, I don't know. And I'm pretty sure the one thing I do know is that nobody else knows either. And I think we ought to recognize our ignorance and not, as it were, fill in the gaps with all sorts of uh, crazy ideas. I think we've got to go, but there's a lot of work to be done to start thinking clearly about these things. We've got to start again. And there's, there's a lot at stake, because it would be a pity if we left a supernatural view of the world, prison one, to go into a naturalistic view of the world, prison two, where we're just parts of the animal kingdom, or indeed parts of the material world.